It wasn't until after I was saved, and just because the Bible says, you know, many hearts, one body, and we are the church, and we are the body of Christ. And each of these teams, whether it's the hospitality team or any of the other teams, are all needed to complete this work and to be his hands and feet. And I'd like to be a spokesperson for him too, a walking billboard. Why not? If it plants a seed, anything that would help lead someone to the kingdom or someone who's on the fence about whether to accept Jesus as their Lord and say, if there's anything I can do to influence that, the Lord just put on my heart where that's our purpose. We're here to serve the Lord and bring Him glory. So if I can do that in any small way, it makes my day. God, in His infinite and divine wisdom, uh, takes a natural born chatterbox and puts her in a place where she gets to talk and meet people as they come in, especially when I'm greeting new visitors and ask them to show them around the coffee station restrooms or kids ministry um, or you know just greeting someone with a cheerful good morning or telling them to have a good week as they exit I feel if I could just touch one person's heart I've done some work for the Lord and that brings me joy. But we had a gentleman that returned back first time visitor and I went up to him and I happened to remember his name which I have difficulty remembering names and I just said I'm so glad you were back and he said he really enjoyed it. So it was kind of a full circle moment, and it was nice to see someone returning, you know, for a second time. It's truly both a privilege and a pleasure. I mean, I'm privileged to be able to serve God, to be His hands and feet, and it's a pleasure for me because, as I said, I'm on a chatterbox and I live alone. So to me, it's an opportunity to speak with people hey, how are you doing? You know, what's going on, and how's the kids, just, you know, no more chit-chat. Um, and I love that because I don't have a lot of visitors in my house, so it's again an opportunity for me. I feel like it's more, I feel as if it's more of a blessing for me than it is for the church because I get so much from it. Everyone shows up for you when you need them and rallies together. All the teams work together in unison. It does feel like an extended family. If anyone's on the fence about whether or not to serve, and they're not sure if that's what they're called to, because I'm still searching for my gift, I don't know what it is, go out there and try something. Um, it may be a fit, it may not, but you're not going to know unless you try it. So step out of your comfort zone, go out there, try to make a difference. That's, that's what we're all supposed to do, go and make disciples of all nature. So we are the body of Christ, as I said, and it takes many, many parts to do that. And the more the merrier, the more handling, light work, and it's just that many more serving God and bringing glory to His kingdom. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give it up for Deborah right there. Come on, guys. Deborah, I know it's hard for you to be in the spotlight, but I want to thank you very much for answering the call when they asked you to do that video to see where you've come from and to see where you are now. You are a true blessing, and I want to thank you so very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you guys so very much again for being here. I'd like to honor one more person here today because I like to honor every single week. And this person actually just stepped up to help us out in a big way. Um, and this is in our tech department. And this individual has been working in so many different ways behind the scenes. She's married to an amazing individual that is part of our A team and sacrificed so many things to make it so this individual can thrive and always has been the help meet um, for Matt Parker. Can we all just give it up for Kimberly Parker? She's in the back right there. Come on, Kim, just wave. Wave at him, wave at him. There you go. This last week, she had just taken on the role of being uh, uh, in charge of our Facebook outreach and putting different stuff. So if you've noticed there's been a change in Facebook, that's because she's rocking it right there. So let's give it up for her one more time. Again, if you like what you see on Facebook, don't be afraid to like it. I've been loving to see all the people in the community who are starting to like and comment on it because all the content, because the Bible is inspiring. Can I get an amen? 
The Bible will change you if we did our, dedicate ourselves to it, and it's changed my life. It has changed me from an insecure seventh grader to see what God has done in my, and when I'm 27 now, and, and I'm just so excited about every area of life. And uh, before I start preaching, would you guys like a little joke? Maybe you've heard this one before, but bear with me if you have. Laugh anyway, and then we'll all have a good laugh. Ready? A young boy had just gotten his driving permit. He asked his father, who was a minister, if they could discuss the use of the car. His father took him to the... Sorry. His father took him to his study and said, I'll make a deal with you. You bring your grades up, study your Bible a little bit, and get your hair cut, and we'll talk about it. After about a month, the boy called back or came back and asked dad if they could discuss the use of the car. They again went to the father's study where his father said, son, I've been real proud of you. You've brought your grades up. You've studied your Bible diligently, but you didn't get your hair cut. The young man waited for a moment and replied, you know, dad, I've been thinking about that. You know, Samson had long hair, Moses had long hair, Noah had long hair, and even Jesus had long hair, to which his father replied, yes, you're right, and they also walked everywhere they went. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so very much for every good and perfect gift that you have rained down from the Father of lights above. I pray a blessing on this time, and may your word in my mouth be clear to us today to prick us at our hearts, to change us, to see a new light, to see a new dimension, to see a new perspective of what your word says about I love my church. I pray a blessing on this time, and may we be able to hear clearly what the Spirit of the Lord wants to say to this church this day. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody say Amen and amen. Well, if you haven't been with us for the last week, we started a brand new series entitled I Love My Church last Sunday, and it was extremely exciting to introduce the topic of this because we learned last week that Jesus said a new commandment that I give to you. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's new. It's new. It's new. It's new. And so Jesus says a new commandment that I'm bringing to you, that you would love one another, and by your love, other people will know that you are my disciples. And so one of the greatest ways to show that you're a follower of Christ is to love everybody else. And, and, and that's to put a plug in for all the people who have haters at their jobs that they have to see every single week, every single day. You got to love them. For those who go home to a very grumpy individual... Got to love them. Got to love them. And so Jesus said, one of the indicators of you being one of my disciples is if you love people like I have loved you. Because Jesus gave his life for us even before we were perfect. And I got an amen. He gave everything up so that we, we can be made perfect. And that's the whole title of this five-part series. And today we're going to be talking about love in community. Love in community. And this is so vital and so important because as we live in small town America, it's so hard because we're so connected on so many ways, but yet we're not intimate with each other. We don't know the issues that we're dealing with. You may know so-and-so and you have a general outline of that person in the town, but you don't know what they're going through behind closed doors. Can I get an amen? And this is one of the biggest struggles that we have in this area. It's not because it's a culture thing. It's because everybody knows everybody. But we think we know them. And because you know that person and that person's family history, you see that person and you put them in a box of blankety, blankety, blank. You know what I'm talking about? And you see this person and they go in this box. You see this person and they go in this box based on something that you either heard about them or you know about them or how their family responds and reacts to things. You know what I'm talking about? So I want to back up a little bit when it comes to love and community. Community is a little bit different in the Bible than it is to what we were raised in. Because community around here is a small town America. Everybody knows everybody. We're all smiling. We're all happy. It's awesome until you hear rumors, right? You know what I'm talking about? And, and, and that can happen over here. But you know somebody, but do you really know what's going on? Now, if you haven't already noticed, there's a fence. And if you didn't notice, I'll pray for you afterwards. But there's a fence. <laughs> Sorry. I like to have fun if you're new to this place. So please don't get offended in anything that I think, say, or do because uh, it's fun. So we got a fence here. And if you look at this fence, we can see, okay, a fence, the definition of a fence is a fence. But fences come in all shapes and all sizes, right? 
You've got a six-foot fence. You've got four-foot fence. You've got pressure-treated fence. You've got non-pressure-treated fence. You've got vinyl fence. You've got cedar fence. You've got this fence. You've got that fence. So when it comes to fences, there's all different shapes and sizes, but they all do two things. They either keep something in or they keep something out. You know what I'm talking about? Now, if you've driven through town, you can probably see a bunch of fences. And obviously, when we look at the fence, either the fence is meant to keep the dog or the rugrats in, or it's to keep your neighbors out. One of the two, right? So the reason why we have a fence is because we are trying to hide something on the other side. The reason why we have that fence is so that way you can portray something on the outside, but yet still hide something that's on the inside, So when you're driving through town, you can see the front of a house. You see the fence to the backyard, but you can see the front of the house. It's all beautiful. You've got the flowers out, and they're blooming before everybody else's house in town. They're just beautiful. And and you go through, the the, the shrubs are are trimmed. The, The grass is mowed. Everything is beautiful in the front yard. Everything is beautiful from what everybody else can see. But... When we, when we have kids, this is the plug for every person who has kids. When we take the, when we take the journey, and I'm going to say goodbye for a while to everybody. When you take the journey behind the fence, you can't see it, but I can. There's a totally different story behind this fence. Because we all have things in this life that we use a fence to try and hide. And if we got the front yard, you see the beautiful flowers, you see the amazing cut grass. But in the back, you've got things like this. There's a toy stroller. There's a chair that only Jimmy can sit in. Why do we have that chair anyway? Better watch out because the ball's coming out at you. And who's ready for a pool party? Ready? All right, here we go, right here. And then over here... I'm not going to ride it, but I've got a scooter. I don't know, or a, or, a, or a skateboard here. And then if you get a little bit deeper and you start looking around and picking up buckets and picking up different things, you're going to find, oh my God, a skunk! I'm no, just kidding. You see, a fence is designed to hide something. And how many times can we use this analogy as a fence to keep people from seeing what we have in the backyard? Because, you know, I just mowed the front yard, but I didn't have time to mow the back. And, and this is beautiful and nice in the front, but I haven't trimmed or pulled the weeds in the garden for a couple different weeks. And, and so what we'll use as a fence is to hide something on the inside. And this fence is a depiction of what a life can be like if we're not willing to be open and honest with who we truly are with other people. Because we can see in life when we're a community, you can see the person's face, but you know what they're going through. Because there are so many people you can see, they're so strong on the outside, but we've never gone with them behind closed doors to find out what's really happening on the inside. Because this fence can depict somebody in your community that looks amazing. They've got it all together. But if they were to open up their doors to you and you check out what the junk that they've got in their trunk, you're going to find out that they're not as perfect as you thought they were. And what's intimidating with somebody who's got a good front yard, what's intimidating about that is you feel insignificant and insecure around that person until you truly figure out what's going on in the back. This is for the moms in the area who look around and see someone who's got like six kids and they're perfect, who's got four kids and they look perfect on the outside and you don't want to talk to that mom because you feel insecure that you can't even handle the two that you've got. Until you truly open up and find out that the mom with five and six kids who looks all perfect is still messing with the same things. Same thing with the dad who could look at community and you see this other guy out there. They, they own a business. Things are going great. Everything is awesome. And you're here trying to run a business and things are falling apart. You can look at somebody who's got a great job. Maybe they're a lawyer. Maybe they're a manager of a department. And you're sitting here still fi- flipping burgers at McDonald's trying to figure out, man, when is my pay raise going to come? And, and I, I don't, never mind, I won't even say what I'm going to say, but I'm going to keep going. And so then we build a fence. Because it's so much easier to hide back here than to face something out here. And this is the big deal when it comes to church. Because you can know somebody in a community and say hi to them. But maybe we don't want to get plugged into a group because we don't want to be open and honest with people because you're afraid that they're going to use it against you. But the very thing that God created was a community of believers. And he said, by this, they will know that you are my disciples when you love one another. 
And this is the whole idea of I love my church. It's to love the people in the church. It's to love the people in our community. And if we're not willing to build that community of people of our inner circle, we're not going to have the goods that we need to overcome the adversities that come against us. Because you're going to have those moments, and I'm tripping over that skateboard, and if I fall, I love you guys. It's all right. If we're not willing to build that community, we're going to get stuck in the backyards of our own life wondering, just taking a peek. Sorry, this is kind of awkward for you, but I'm just making an analogy. You wonder when life is going to turn around and then what can happen is when you get weak, you will turn into a victim mentality and then now you're victimizing other people and saying it's their fault for why you're dealing with what you're dealing with, which builds more of a fence. And now you've got two fences that you've got to take down in order for you to gain that relationship with people because they're in the vicinity, but they're not intimate. Have you ever been surrounded by people and still feel lonely? Yes. That's a fence. That's a fence. That's a fence that's been built up in your heart, and no, you can't see it, but yet it's even bigger. You know what's really cool about fences and about walls? I know a guy who can break down walls if we just shout and praise him after seven days of walking around the city. So no matter what kind of walls and what kind of fences you're dealing with, God can still break it down. And I want to bring you to a scripture here found in, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 and 25. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 and 25. But before I tell you that, I want to tell you something about something that the, my grandfather told me. And, and it, the, the background story to this is, is he owned a painting contracting business. And whenever I came back to the Lord, that's who God used. And I worked with my grandfather. And he said this. Everybody listen up because I didn't have it for the screen. But listen up. He said this to me. He says, you can tell a contractor's skill in their trim work, but you find out their dedication in their closet work. You can find out how, basically this is what he's saying. You can find out how skill a person is via their front yard, but you find out their dedication and their character when you can see their backyard. When you see somebody at face value, you will make intuitions about that person that may be completely false. Don't judge the book by the cover. You know what I'm talking about? You can look at somebody who looks like they've got it all or someone who doesn't have anything. And if we're going to judge the book by the fence that they portray without getting into their backyard to find out who they are, we are not giving them the benefit of the doubt and we're putting them in a judgment and now we're building a fence between us and them because we've characterized that person rather than creating a community with that person. Amen. I know I'm digging into your guys' uh, your closets here, but we're going to break down some fences here today because Jesus did something for us that is so true that I'm going to read it right now in Hebrews chapter 10 after I get a drink of my trough here. It says this, the writer of Hebrews calls this a call to persevere. Verse 19, and so dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's because of the blood. Turn to your other neighbor and say, it's because of the blood. 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 Let me tell you something about the most holy place. If you don't know Jewish tradition, if you don't know a little bit about it, I'm going to teach you just a little bit. I don't know all about it, but I know a little bit enough about it to be dangerous. So if I am wrong for all of the Jewish scholars that we have out there, the ones who read the Torah every single day, you know, those ones, I am sorry if I mess a little bit up. So have some grace with me. Okay. Jesus did a lot for me still, so pr pray for me. Don't come to me, pray for me. And so what we can see throughout history is, is, is when, when I talked about the crisis here a couple weeks ago, Adam and Eve were given everything. They were given dominion over the heavens and the earth and all that therein is. And then when they sinned, they disobeyed God, and then they fell from his righteous standard. They were righteous before, but they made the choice to walk away from that righteousness. And thus, God had to make a way to bring them back into fellowship with him. That has been the plan of salvation. That has been the plan that Jesus came for. He entered heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. We can now boldly enter that place because of Jesus. But there was a crisis that he had to overcome. And so... 
Before Jesus came, God sent the law to the Jewish um, believers. He sent the laws to the Jews, to Israel, on behalf of Abraham, because Abraham was counted as righteous because of his faith in God. And so Abraham and his generation became the Israelites, all right? And so he gave them ways to worship God that was a figure of what was to come. And so what we first started out with Moses, he, he, he rescued uh, Israel from Egypt, and then they developed something called the tabernacle. Moses was the leader, but Aaron, his brother, was the high priest. And so when you enter into the tabernacle, there's three different parts to the tabernacle. And eventually this tabernacle became a temple that was built by Solomon. But it started out as a tent because Israel was moving to different place after different place after different place. So it was portable. Let me tell you something. The glory of God is still portable. Wherever you go, it goes. Yeah. Wherever it go, it, you go, it goes, all right? And so now we've got the tabernacle. The three parts was the outer courts, and that's where everybody could come in and do worship. And then you went, go into the building, go into the tabernacle. Now you have the holy place. A bunch of different things were in the holy place. The table of shoe bread, you've got the golden lampstand, and there's another altar in there, and that's where the priests would go in and do their, their weekly offerings for sacrifice, because there has to be a shedding of blood for, to be, for there to be a forgiveness of sin. And so back in the day, they would offer the blood and the sacrifices of goats, of bulls, of turtle doves, of many different things to cover the sin, because it was a type and shadow of what was to come. Can I get an amen? Amen. You might not understand this. You might be thinking of bull. Let's go get some prime rib. But the bulls back then were used to cover the sin. They were offering them for the sacrifice of sin. But there was the third part of the tabernacle and the temple called the most holy place. Turn to your neighbor and say, most holy place. It's also called the holy of holies. And even though the priests went into the holy place, not the most holy place, the holy place, and offered for the sins, the most holy place was where the presence of God sat. And because it was the most holy place, inside the most holy place, you had the Ark of the Covenant, which had the Ten Commandments in it. It had manna in it, and it also had Aaron's staff, the first high priest. It had his staff, which had budded, to show that God is life. No matter if something's dead, God will bring life to it. And so on top of the Ark of the Covenant, you have the, the, the cherubims with their wings touching over top of it, and underneath the wings was called the mercy seat. Turn to your neighbor and say, the mercy seat. Because God did not come to condemn the world, he came to bring mercy, amen? He didn't come to condemn you and build a community of haters, he came to build a community of mercy, amen? And so when they entered into the most holy place, this is the cool part, they could only go once a year. And not just anybody could go into the most holy place. This was the in crowd. This was the high priest, the one who was head over all of it. So in that time, it was Aaron, and then he passed down the high priest position to one of his sons. And so the high priest would go in sacrificing a bull, I believe, for his sin and for the sins of the priest. But then he also offered a goat's blood for the sin of the people. Now, let me tell you something about the most holy place, because in the presence of God, there can be no sin. Can I get an amen? And so there is something very sacred about the presence of God that sin cannot stand, and whatever is sinful, it's dead, all right? So when the priest was about to enter in to the most holy place, they would tie a rope to his leg, because if there was something that he didn't confess or something that he was holding on to, when he walked into God's presence, he would fall over dead. Not because God wanted to kill him, but because that's the power of God's presence. That's why it is a representation. You guys ready for the representation? That is the real reason why Hebrews chapter 10 verse 19 is so important. It says we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. I don't know about you, but I ain't as good as a priest who's been trained up in the Torah, been trained up into Jewish law, trained up into following everything. I'm not as good as them, but I'm as good as Jesus whenever he died and paid for my sins. And so I don't have to fear anymore to come into the most holy place and you have to drag me out by a rope because I've been washed by the blood of Jesus, not by the blood of a goat. Yeah. And so what happened is the priest would go in and he would sacrifice for the sins of the priest first and then the sins of the people after he would do that once a year in the most holy place. And when he sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat, God's mercy covered their sin for that year. That's how powerful that was back then. Now, if we think about it, 
that's, everybody get what I'm talking about there? Yeah. So they went in, the most holy place, God's presence was there, and people who were sinful were died, and probably if Billy was the high priest, uh, he went in, had something he didn't confess, and his wife goes, well, I knew that was going to be the death of him anyway, and he comes back out, she says, I'll talk to him in heaven, it'll be all right. And so verse 19, or, uh, verse 19 chapter 10. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. We don't have to worry about shame, no more guilt, no more condemnation, because Jesus' blood paid it all. Amen? And so that mercy seat that sits, because the tabernacle and the temple were depictions of what's truly up in heaven. Moses saw what was up in heaven, and God says, build what you see. How many picture people do I got in the house? You can't do something unless you see it. So God showed Moses a picture of what was in heaven, and so he built it here on earth. And so Jesus entered into, I'm just going to read because I'm just going to let the Bible explain itself. Verse 20, eventually we'll get to 20 here. By his death, that was by Christ's death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with with Christ's blood to make us clean. Everybody should shout amen to that right there. We are sprinkled on with Christ's blood and we've been made clean. And our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope. Everybody say it's hope. hope. That we affirm for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Amen. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and to good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of the return is drawing near. Amen, guys? Amen? Amen. And so I just told you a story about when Jesus came down and he died on the cross. He went back to heaven and brought his blood. Just like every single year, the high priest would slaughter a bull and he would slaughter a goat and he would enter into the most holy place and he would sprinkle the blood of the bulls and the blood of goats on top of the Ark of the Covenant, on top of the mercy seat. And that whole year's sin for the people and for the priest was totally wiped clean, totally forgiven. So when Jesus said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Jesus took his blood. He ascended into heaven after 40 days. He brought forth the blood that he sacrificed for your and our sin. And this blood, my friends, is far more valuable than a bull's. It is far more valuable than a goat's. He came in so he didn't have to come every single year. The Bible says in Hebrews, he came once for all to cover all of our sins, past, present, and future. And in essence, church, this is what Jesus did. He broke down the fence between us and God. Amen? Come on. So what Jesus did, we need to know this. Number one point is know that Jesus tore down the fence. I know I probably scared a few of you. Sorry, baby, right there. I had a rope. I promise you. I should have like a note to let everybody know. Flashing lights. If you get this, watch out. The pastor's going to go crazy. It's going to be okay. But know that Jesus tore down the fence. You see, there was a fence that was built between you and God when we sinned because we inherited that sinful nature from our father Adam, from our parents. But Jesus came to cover that sin, and by his blood, we can enter boldly into the throne room of grace. And so now we don't have any more issues. We don't have any more problems between us and God because Jesus tore down the fence. And let me tell you something. I forgot this part. There, the most holy place and the holy place was one big room. The only thing that separated the most holy place with the holy place was a four-inch, the two to four-inch thick curtain. And what the Bible says is when Jesus breathed his last breath and gave up his spirit, that curtain was tore into two from top to bottom. It is said that no man could tear it. And it's also said that no team of horses could tear it. But the hand of God came down and rent that, that veil in two so he can get out to you. And so you can come into his house. You don't have to worry anymore about being perfect because you are made righteous by Jesus' blood, what he did on the cross. So we need to remember, when it comes to fences, between you and God, there are none. Between you and God, there are none. Whenever you go and do a piece of stupid, you can still boldly enter the throne room of grace because the mercy seat is ready for you to come before the altar. It's the mercy seat. 
Not the condemnation seat, but the mercy seat. And so we need to know that we don't have to. Can I put another plug in? Because I had someone tell me this this morning and say, you've got, you've got more pull than me when it comes to, not condemning this person, I was laughing with them before, but um, you've got more pull than me to pray to, to him. You know that? I said, no, every one of us has the same blood that sprinkled our hearts than I did, all right? Yeah. Bible school doesn't make you more holy, and some parts it might mess you up even more, Okay. <laughs> But you need to have that relationship, God, to realize that I don't care if you've done a piece of stupid or you're content, or even if you're still addicted to drugs, you're still addicted to pornography, you're still addicted to these things, or you're still with a lady's insecurity. That's a big one. Those are things that are guilting your conscience, but it says by the power of Jesus, he's ripped away our guilty conscience and given us a clean heart. So just remember that Jesus tore down the fence. So between you and God, you're good. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Turn to your other and say, Man, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. And so if you have anything to remember, the fence fell, and so yours, between God, it's gone. Amen. Now, I was going to bring in a sledgehammer, break it apart, but because we don't have a 4,000 square foot auditorium, I couldn't do that. But this is the next point that I want to make with each and every one of you is this. I don't know if this is going to work or not, but I'm going to try it anyway. We can stand here today knowing that our our, our shame has been taken away by Christ. But what happens is, because people are people, we can do this when it comes to, I'm good with God, but when it comes to you, baby, I got to test you first. Oh, there we go. Hold on. And so we put up these walls when we get around people because we know people aren't perfect, right? But what happens is, is Jesus came to tear down the walls. Why are we building more? Why are we building more? And so my second point to you is this. We need to daily tear down the fences between each other. Because God did it for you, we need to do it for others, and we need to be that representation of Christ to love my church, which means to love people even if they're not trustable. Can I get an amen to that? You can forgive somebody. Can I get an amen? You can love somebody, but you don't have to trust them. There's a difference between love and trust. Whenever you say, I love you, that doesn't mean I automatically trust you, right? If a husband does something to offend the wife, he says, I love you, that doesn't mean she has to automatically trust him again. Trust is something you earn back, but love is something you give, not because of what they did, but because of who Jesus is in you. And so when it comes to loving somebody, you can love them, but you don't have to trust them. But you need to tear down that fence that says, whoa, stay back, stay back, stay back. Because we need to have people. And I'm not saying open up to every person you know, because that would be a mess, right? (laughs) Don't do that. But when it comes to, you need to tear down that fence, because there could be a fence of forgiveness right here. Know what I'm talking about? There could be that fence of forgiveness that says, yeah, I'll take that apology when you apologize to me. Or I'll say I'm sorry when you say you're sorry to me. I'll come to your Christmas party when you invite me. You've got a pool too and you don't even let me in your pool. Now nah, I'm not done. I'm done. Sorry. Let me tell you something. If we're not going to tear down the fence before someone says, I'm sorry, when they say, I'm sorry, it's going to be a mess anyway. If we're not willing to be proactive when it comes to the fences that built in our life, whether it's offense, whether it's a unforgiveness, whether it's a this or that, or a doctor's report, really, you need to tear down that fence. You need to tear it down now because the day will come when the walls will fall. But if your heart's not ready for it, it ain't going to work. Because that person's going to come to you and say they're sorry and truly repent. But if you don't have your heart open to it, you're not going to receive it and make it worse. And so when we tear down the fences between us and each other, we need to do it now. We need to do it now before the actual thing comes. That's what I taught you a couple weeks ago. Can you believe in the miracle before you see the manifestation? Can you receive the forgiveness and give the forgiveness before you have that person come and say, I'm sorry? And the last thing is this. Sorry, let me read verse 25. It says, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, 
but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. So many times people are trying to take this scripture and say, everybody needs to come to church every single Sunday. Don't neglect the assembling of yourselves together. Don't neglect church. Don't neglect your regroup. Let me tell you this. I'm talking about getting together with people outside of a church function. Amen. And I tell this to my leadership team all the time. Take somebody out to coffee. You don't have to go on a date. Take somebody out to coffee. Ask them how they're doing. I do that more and more nowadays, talking about instead of saying, hey, how are you? How are you? I say, how are you really doing? Because when you're able to dive in and help somebody, it brings more healing to you, not only them, but to you. And so don't neglect the meeting of yourselves together. Don't get caught up in your own life. Realize that we're all in this thing together. And when we create a community, I, I've also heard this saying before too, it takes a village to raise a child. And so it takes a village to raise this church up. It takes us being together, not just participating in a group, which is good. Check out the list. Not just coming to church every week, which is good. But don't allow them to be a checklist. Amen. Don't have a checklist community. I called this person. I called that person. I called this person. Amen. Let it be from the heart. Amen. Let it be from the heart. My question to you is, whose yard are you in and who's in your yard? If we're going to build that fence and not allow anybody into our yard, we're not willing to grow. Because God created the church to create a community to love one another. And if we're not going to take part in that community, we're, we're saying no to something that God established that is meant to be good. So who is in your yard and who's in your yard? I think I just said the same thing, but never mind. <laughs> community is standing in someone's yard, and it also means you stand in someone else's yard and... You embrace, number three, the power of your influence. This is my last one, and I'm going to close here. Embrace the power of your influence. Because you have pull whether you think it or not. And whether you think someone's listening to you, you are truly making a difference in their lives. Whether you think that their eyes are focused on you, you are making a difference. Whether you think your four or five-year-old is listening, they are. And I can prove to you that that is true. You may have a rogue teenager, but guess what? They're listening. That seed may not have gotten planted in their heart, but they're listening. That seed has just been sowed. It may take time for it to grow, but it will grow. That rogue teenager who hates you at 17 will run back to you at 27 and say, thank you. I don't know if I have any parents in the house that can agree with me right there. That rogue 17 year old, when they're 30, they're going to say, thank you. That 17-year-old that's a little bit messed up, that 16-year-old that's a little bit messed up, when they're 25, they're going to say, thank you for disciplining me when I was a child. Now, embrace the power of your influence. Listen up. Embrace the power of your influence. I'm going to tell you one last story, and we're going to close. Are you ready? I've said this before, but it really impressed in my heart this week because I shared it in our, my group this last week. You can turn on that back track, and then we're going to close because I went over time again. I think it was, it was when we got married, so it was seven years ago, seven years ago, I was working at a, a job, and within three months, I got promoted to be a, over the smaller department in the area, but it was the first department, and I had three people that were underneath me, but then I was only 20 years old, no experience, no nothing, so they had put me over this department that had three people in it that were as old as my grandparents, and they had kids that were older than me. And so you've got people who are older than you, more experienced than you, have much more wisdom than you, not wanting to listen to you. And I think that they came together before and had a meeting and wanted to make my life a living hell at work. So to eight to nine hours a day, I was dealing with people who didn't like me, who didn't listen to me. Every time I gave them a task or a job to do, even though if it was smart, they said it was dumb. And they tried to belittle me in every different way that we can, trying to bring things up, how this would have been better, that would have been better. And, and to me, as a young individual, I took it personal. And I started building a fence. And instead of taking this fence and beating them with it, I actually brought it home and beat my wife with it because I was complaining day after day of how horrible my job was. And that fence was causing more problems, not only at work, but at home. But I still decided then, and God was working in my heart, not to take it out on them. Not to, like, take it out on them and tell them they're horrible people and they need to listen to me and be that overruling boss, but my Lord just told me just to keep loving them. Don't blow up. 
Don't blow up. Keep loving them. And if they disagree, then say, I'm sorry that you disagree, but this is what we're doing. And those two years that I worked in that department was horrible and was hell. Fast forward mm, four years. I had gone to Colorado, came back, had a new child, and we were just about to go in to get some blood work done and go to an appointment for when Adeline, right before Adeline was born. And as I'm walking back in, I had to go back to the car to get something. And as I'm walking back in, one of those guys in that department was getting wheeled out in a wheelchair. And I asked him how he was doing. And by then he said his wife had already passed away because she was struggling back then. And, and now his health was failing. And so I got to talk to him a little bit and tell him that we're praying for him. And, and I still, I mean, I just had this overwhelming sense of love for this guy, even though he made my life miserable for two years. And as I'm about to take the turn, I said goodbye. I was about to take the turn to go into the spot where Cassie was having her appointment. And I could hear this guy telling the guy who's wheeling them out on the wheelchair. And he said, you know that boy right there? He's an awesome young man. I wish there was more like that in this world. And as he kept wheeling him out. Amen. Don't overlook the power, the influence that you have, no matter what the external situation may be. Because you may be changing somebody's life even if you don't feel it. Can I pray for you? Everybody stand. Because I believe in this place there are going to be people who have those people in their life that are making it a living hell. And I want you to embrace the moment of that fence, face it down, tear it down, and start loving that person no matter what they're doing to you. Heavenly Father, I thank you so very much for this moment, for this time, for us to make a decision that we are going to do it God's way and not our way. God, I thank you that we are tearing down the fences because you tore down the fence between us and you. And God, as we stand before here today, I pray that we would realize the influence that we have and start walking in that influence. To realize that the power that we have because Jesus is in us and help us walk in that. God, give us the strength and the courage to love people who are unlovable, to show them the Jesus that's inside of us rather than the emotions that we're feeling. God, help us break down those fences of unforgiveness, break down those fences of offense, break down those traps that the devil has placed in our life. Right now, I just feel the spirit of God touching marriages in this house, whether your husband or your wife is with you or not. The people who are watching online, you are going to experience that overwhelming love of the Holy Spirit for you so you can bring that love to your spouse, that he is going to forgive wrongs that haven't even been spoken yet. He is going to forgive issues that you're dealing with now. And right now, we just lift up the children in this place. We lift up your children, Father. Your word says that we need to have faith like a child. So God, may we have that faith and believe you and see what your word says at face value. I lift up the teenagers in this place, God, as they're going through whatever they're going through. Whether it's an insecurity or whether it's a, a backbiting from a friend, rejection, whatever it may be, God, we lift them up to you for your spirit to quicken them so they can do what your word says about loving one another by first loving ourselves. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you for clarity to take these next steps, to take ownership in creating a community in our life. May we take a step to further our community in you and with each other. I thank you for this and I praise you for it. And in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. 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 Well, if you got anything good, got a hand clap of praise, y'all. Come on now. God bless you guys this week. Thank you so very much for coming. I'm sorry, again, I preached too long, but my handout next step to you is take ownership and create a community this week. Nobody's going to do it for you. You got to do it. God bless you guys. Have a great week. In Jesus